in the company. It's, uh, I think, the first time that... I need microphone. I'd prefer not, if that's okay. Well, that's like louder. That I can do. We're recording. All right, I will speak up. sort of close to it. I think that's the first time that the introduction has been so clever that there's really nothing left for me to say. <laughs> this talk is uh, mildly autobiographical, which I think one has the excuse to do in such uh, circumstances, celebrating Sergei's uh, 60th birthday, so he claims. I frankly don't believe a word of it. <laughs> and uh, I'm here also perhaps representing NY the NYU friends of Sergei, who are, who are sitting uh, back there. Uh, and we all feel very honored to be uh, groupies, Sergei groupies. So I'm going to talk about uh, game theory and a little bit of foundations of quantum mechanics, but I put uh, this in a, in a, I hope, a somewhat intriguing uh, format. And uh, it's going to be a very light talk for two reasons. One is uh, I think those might make better talks, and the other is that's all I'm capable of giving right now. It, so uh, I'm not going to do any real math, but I will point to some real math uh, as I go. So uh, I have nothing to say about positive probability, it turns out. Uh, I'm really going to talk about zero probability and negative probability. Uh, but since I was first taught positive probability, including outright lies, such as in high school we were taught that if a coin comes up head 99 times in a row, then the probability of it coming out heads on the 100th toss is also a half. Uh, lies that one has to unlearn over the years. Um, I did have that much to say about positive probability. But let me talk about game theory and try to make the case that zero probability really emerges in a very distinct and fundamental way in probability theory. Um, I should also recognize that uh, I'm talking uh, about a subject uh, that one of the audience members uh, knows far more about than I do, maybe several, but sitting in the audience is Pierre Paolo Bertigali, who's fundamental work in game theory, I will basically talk about it. Then I may have uh, something more original to say about foundations of quantum mechanics. Okay, so, let's try this. Yes. So, uh, the talk starts with common sense and ends with nonsense, as you will see. <laughs> so, the, we're going we're gonna to start with some common sense. And let me talk a bit about some game theory. I'm going to uh, just make a few remarks about an approach to game theory that I think we will discuss further at the panel later on. Uh, and uh, this is just a preview of uh, that, if you like, uh, and also uh, the broadest kind of uh, what description of an approach to game theory that has emerged over the last 25 years, approximately. Uh, you could call it a foundation approach, but in a way, I would prefer to call that an alternative approach. Uh, it is not merely to uh, inquire what is beneath what exists, but to build a different game theory. Anyway, in short, it's an area called epistemic game theory, or at least it's commonly known as epistemic game theory. And the thesis of epistemic game theory, at least one way of putting it, is that the notion of a game is no longer the classical game matrix or game tree, but is expanded, extended, to include something that might be called a belief structure. I was going to give a quick introduction to this area, I think, in his uh, panel remarks. I'm not going to say anything on the panel because I think I want to devote all my time to Pierre Paolo. So I'm, I will, I have, I have two sentences. To the panel. <laughs> and uh, by that we mean uh, something that I think everybody thinks about intuitively when they first think of something like a game or hear a game theory, which is some way of capturing, but here within the formal description of a game, what each player thinks 
thinks others think, and perhaps, and so on. And thinks about what? Well, anything that is uncertain. And more conventionally, and pioneered by Hassani, this would be the structure of the game. In his case, the so called power functions. But more radically, because it's very different from an equilibrium analysis of games, uncertainty about the actual strategies chosen in the game or the moves chosen, and of course, these are only headlines. That's the beginning of a serious investigation. And if you like, epistemic game theory can be thought of as respecting what uh, in uh, game theory terms uh, the allied disciplines would be called decision theory or one person game theory, but decision theory, a la Savage and predecessors and successors, the trilogy of decision theory. Strategies and the notion of chaos, as they call it, in game theory jargon, or they call the evaluation of outcomes, but also probabilities, perhaps some other way of talking about uncertainty, but no one talk about probabilities, about what is uncertain. And that those are all three inputs, that's the key word, into a game model. So if you think about the game matrix, of course, we have the strategies and the payoffs. But in the inputs, the, the model itself, we don't have the probabilities, at least not over all of the uncertainties that I mentioned here. We could in, perhaps interpret a conventional approach such as Nash equilibrium as perhaps informing us, giving us outputs, something about probabilities that would be the complete reversal. But it's not only that, but it's a very different kind of thing. So that's a little sketch of an approach to game theory. I'm going to talk about probability zero. So I'm going to give a very casual uh, treatment of what I think is a fascinating, as I said, fundamental aspect of bringing probability to game theory. So here we have a game tree, or a piece of a game tree. And uh, you'll see in the talk that for the first part of the talk, I talk about Anne and Bob. And for the second half of the talk, I talk about Alice and Bob. And this apparently is uh, the rule. In game theory, you must talk about Anne and Bob. And in physics, you must talk about Alice and Bob. I guess in computer science, too. Um, and in fact, Nussen and I did a computer search and found that this rule is, is obeyed in the majority of cases, although not in every single case. But any time you see Anne, you those off, that means I'm still talking about game theory. And if you see Alice, I must have moved on to something else. Or if the whole thing is so unclear, you have no idea where I am. Um, that would be a trick word. And is Eloise and Oppenheim used in your Of course. Yeah, we're much more on a slab. Or if I wake up, uh, I think that Bob has to grow. <laughs> there's, 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 there's many ways in which one can exercise the imagination in this area. So suppose Bob, there he is, he moves, if he gets to move at the second node, assigns probability one to Anne's playing left. Let's take a look, in fact. Anne has three strategies in this tree. Let's suppose this is the whole tree. She can choose left. That's a strategy, sometimes called a reduced strategy, but that is an unambiguous plan for how Anne will play the game. She can choose right, meaning all up, cats there, yeah, right? Big right, cats right, and then little left, that's a strategy, and she can choose right and little left. So she has three strategies. Suppose Bob assigns problem D1 to the first of the three. Uh, so in that case, uh, we're in a simple finite setting. Bob's conditional probabilities, uh, if we condition on the event that Anne's strategy is not left, is undefined, as we would first approach using probabilities here. Of course, Bob's expected power is well defined. He assigns probability one to Anne's playing left and gets some power. Okay, so 
so far so good. Now let's be a bit of a game for us, if you like, and ask what happens if Anne thinks it possible, more formally, but nothing very formal here, assigns positive probability to the event we just described. The event being Bob assigns probability one to Anne's playing left. All of this is going to be in words and pictures. Uh, I think you'll see a uh, more serious set of remarks here, a more serious set of remarks about uh, formal epistemic game theory later on, but not for me. And certainly not at this time of day. And so we're now asking something about uh, how we think about what Anne thinks about what Bob thinks. And presumably our interest in that is because we want to be able to deduce something about what Anne does at her first note. Should she, in fact, play left or right? Now, she thinks it possible. She might even think it very possible or even subjectively certain that Bob thinks that she's going to play back. But that doesn't mean she has to play back. And the question is, what should she, in fact, do? And we can't answer that question well without some way of talking about how Anne thinks Bob would react to this word if, in fact, she did play right. Okay? So here's my first point. Notice that what is chance from the point of view of one player, namely Bob, and when I play right at the first note, that's, that's chance. That's a little like nature, but not really, because we're thinking of Anne as a player with chaos and uh, interested in her expected payoff or something like that. But what is chance, conventionally probabilistic, if you like, from the point of view of Bob, is under, is very different from the point of view of that because it's under her control. So, in particular, the probability zero event that Anne does not play that, she plays one of the other two strategies, starting with right at her first node, cannot, in the usual way of the night, that's just two finite probability theory, be neglected. Although it can be from Bob's perspective. He has a well-defined expected payoff, but it can't be from Anne's perspective. So this is an inherently multiplayer, interac interactive, if you like, oops, um, phenomenon. And um, can I get back to the sliding question? is that probability zero events seem to take on a very different conceptual flavor in game theory as opposed to what we call on other terms using in your decision theory or if you like a one player game against nature. And uh, where do we go with this? So what we need to think about if we're going to pursue this style of game theory is uh, an extension to their simple probability theory in a finite setting, but I've said more generally from a world probability theory. Um, that, that includes in some explicit fashion conditioning on probability zero events. And I will indicate in a few minutes how that extension might go. And uh, refer to some work by uh, my colleague. But let's ask ourselves a question that you may be asking yourselves before we quite proceed with that, which is maybe I made right with the myself. Why don't I simply require the players to find a certain positive probability for the future before that events? Question. So I'm going to answer that uh, by taking what appears to be a little bit of a detour, uh, but then things will come back together. 
So let's put the game tree down for a few minutes and turn instead to game matrix and go through what might have first seemed like a different issue and then they will connect and in the course of doing so I think you'll see about the extension the probability theory that, that I'm referring to here and uh, involved in that the way in which in effect we are wanting to give strictly positive probability to each of our events but in a way that's definitely chosen to serve our purposes as game theorists. So apparent end of chapter, put this down for a minute, start a new chapter and then the two chapters will come together. Okay, here is a simple two by two game matrix. We're still, we're still doing game theory, right? We have Anne and Bob. And uh, I always like to make games, games of uh, in pure coordination where possible because there's a misapprehension, a misperception, is the correct word. Um, this is a one copy book, so there will be a number of errors. There'll be fewer errors if it was a two copy talk. <laughs> and the flight back to China talk, yes? Uh, there's that too. Yes. <laughs> And uh, uh, so misperception that game theory really comes into its own once there are, if you like, conflicts of interest, as well, not just commonality of interest. <coughs> um, it breaks my heart to say that this misperception goes all the way back to von Neumann and Morgenstern. Um, but even they didn't get everything right. Um, but it is uh, widespread. Uh, a well-known uh, leading textbook in the field by the Robert Madison is called Game Theory, the Analysis of Conflict. So I view it as a matter of pride to do as much game theory as possible with games of common interest. It's also a very important point conceptually because the coordination, if you like, <laughs> is a fundamental social process or other kind of process. Even if we're at a where even like, and uh, and he's engaged in casual empiricism and from the N1 business school. A great deal of human activity and management is spent on coordination. They should not be dismissed as somehow obvious or easy. So all of that is uh, just by the by. Anyway, so here is a two by two matrix. Uh, now we're going to talk about uh, dominance relationships uh, among rows, strategies, and likewise columns. Um, and I'm going to talk about what's uh, something called weak dominance, as distinguished from strong dominance, but you can just call it dominance. So if we look at uh, the matrix from Bob's perspective, and uh, let me explain how the payoffs are written. Um, it doesn't matter. So uh, I was going to tell you that the second payoff was Bob. The second payoff was Bob. <laughs> then if Anne plays up, Bob gets two regardless of his choice left versus right. If she plays down, uh, it matters. Bob gets one from left and three from right. Uh, in game theory jargon, uh, left is dominated weakly because there is one tie by right. It would be a very natural decision criterion as a long pedigree uh, to uh, ask Bob to choose right versus left. Um, that's examine that, see where it leads us. Uh, now, very clear to see in this example, uh, there's no uh, full support probability distribution uh, that assigns strictly positive probability, that is, to both up and down, um, under which uh, left would use the highest expected pair. Obviously, there's a knife edge case where Bob is precisely probability one on up. up. That's a stupid question because otherwise I won't have any idea what's in the world. Are we talking about games where one player plays first and the way it is, and the other player plays second? Are we talking about both of them playing in the blind? Yeah, I'm talking about the latter case. I figured, I figured so because the logicians around here talk always about the former case. Uh, oh, in, you know, that. in, yes. in the mm -hmm. set theory in various places. They're talking about this other yeah. So, 
So it's not real game theory, I'm just saying, okay, well, of course. Maybe the dishes are not real people anyway. <laughs> I don't consider myself a real person. So, so uh, thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, so, uh, that is um, going all the way up back to von Neumann's 1928 paper, which is the fundamental paper, and famous for the formulation of proof of the Minimax theorem. But in fact, the paper that formulates the notion of a game tree in not as much generality as came later, but did so, and then introduced the concept of strategy for the tree, um, the, the full plan in the obvious sense, as I was describing that simple example. Uh, from that, it uh, allows us to write down an associated game matrix, um, which one Neumann viewed as the suitable object for analysis, and he's a pains to say by the very nature of this process, if I can not know another player strategy. Serve moves in the tree. But I can't know a strategy from the very nature of how it's defined. Maybe it's the plan for the game. So uh, that was all the, the longer answer, but the shorter answer was yes to the second <laughs> possibility. So we should think about Anne and Bob here as uh, choosing um, each without knowing the other's choice. So, um, Clearly, obviously. Um, Bob does not have uh, a probability distribution that puts strictly positive probability in up and down under which uh, left is optimal. That's a general equivalence, namely uh, a strategy is uh, dominated in this sense. Let's assume we're in a finite game. In other words, uh, a, set of, a finite set of strategies for each player. Um, if and only if there is no full support probability distribution on the uh, tools of strategy choices to the other players under which the strategy in question is optimal. Um, okay, now, uh, if we think of this uh, informally, well, everything's informal, in the style of epistemic game theory, uh, this leads to uh, an interesting kind of a puzzle because, um, let's see, so what we're saying is Perhaps uh, Bob is uh, going to adhere to this dominance criterion, and um, if so, so hope it's the last time I do that. If so, it's part of the talk. Apparently, an inescapable part of the talk. Um, if he does, then what we saw was. He will choose right, not left. So, in the start of game theorists, and again, just being very informed about it, let's suppose that Anne reasons this way about Bob. It seems she reaches the conclusion then that Bob will play right. And perhaps that means he should, she should put probability one on Bob's playing right, and probability zero on his playing left. But if Anne is following the same criterion as we suggested Bob might follow, then perhaps she ought to be putting positive probability on both strategies. So there seems to be some kind of conflict between this criterion and appropriate uh, reasoning, levels of reasoning, about the players following the criterion. And I should have put in a reference here to um, Larry Samuelson, a game theorist who essentially posed this puzzle in the early 1990s. So, how might we resolve this puzzle? I'm going to touch on it. Okay. This one? Yes. Okay. I like that. Okay. So, here's a route that refers to some uh, work of mine with two co-authors some years ago which is uh, we, we, we attach to a player not one probability measure, but a sequence of probability measures. Uh, the sequence can be thought of as a primary, secondary, tertiary, etc. hypothesis about what the other player might do. And the way the sequence is made into a decision criterion is lexicographically, in the sense that 
here, if that's how, let's say, Anne uh, looks at the game, um, Anne's best strategy or strategies is found by first calculating what's best under her primary hypothesis or her first probability measure, uh, drawing out everything that fails to meet that test among the survivors, in other words, the strategies that tie under the primary hypothesis, test them under the secondary hypothesis, and so on. Uh, intuitively or formally, if you want to use uh, infinitesimals, uh, Anne's uh, approach here is that she considers Bob's strategies that receive positive probability under her primary measure infinitely more likely than those that receive positive probability under her secondary measure, and so on. And this gives us a way of resolving the tension that I just described, um, owing to the proposition at the top here, which is that a strategy will be undominated in the sense we saw, if and only if there is one of these lexicographic probability systems, provided the system gives positive probability to each of Bob's strategies somewhere in the hierarchy, um, under which it is lexicographically optimal. So, although I'm just sketching, and I'm sketching very, very broadly here, what we have arrived at is a way of doing game theory that allows, and if you think back to our example, simultaneously, and I'm reluctant to press the back button, who knows what will happen, so I think I'll need to in a few minutes. There we go, let's try this. Yes, uh, for Anne simultaneously to attach positive probability to both of our strategies in the sense that, in the, the new sense, that she puts positive weight on each of these strategies somewhere in her hierarchy, somewhere in her lexicographic probability system, while at the same time there is a sense in which she could consider right a whole lot, in fact, more infinitely more likely than left. Um, because right gets better say, you know, I'm not, in any sense, adding this up, uh, positive primary probability, but left gets any positive secondary probability. So that's a puzzle. that started from a different place. This was having put the tree down and started with something different. And a sketch, I hope somewhat intelligible, of a resolution to the puzzle. Okay. Now let me connect everything and connect what we've been talking about, which is epistemic game theory in the tree, with the exercise, which was epistemic in style that I just went through. And uh, this is a proposition that uh, I'm, I, I. Uh, only claim in as much as it's almost stated in a number of places, but uh, um, the key here is to bring these two approaches to our players together. So uh, this is the precise statement. So if we look at uh, one of our undominated strategies, they're also called admissible in game theory, um, or rather if you look at the strategy, it's admissible, undominated, uh, if and only if, um, if we look at any ch game tree that gives rise to a matrix in the sense I was describing a couple of minutes ago, um, that strategy is also optimal in the tree. And it's optimal in the sense that now tells us what is the extension of probability theory that we were looking for several slides back. So we stopped our analysis of the tree and said, what might we do to extend probability theory of the tree? And I stopped there, and then I went to the matrix, and I went to a story on the matrix, and we resolved the puzzle on the matrix, which is kind of what I'm having here, so I played in the sketch. But in fact, the resolution of the issue on the tree and on the matrix come together in precisely this fashion. And the beautiful answer on the tree, um, there are the fundamental papers by Bhattacharya sitting in the audience and uh, Machana 
who uh, uses a concept that was developed completely different purpose. He uses a beautiful extension of common law of probability theory due to Renyi in 1955 um, that I suspect some of you know, uh, or similar extensions called, uh, not exactly his language, but what's commonly called the conditional probability system. And uh, a conditional probability system extends your theory by specifying the primitive, not just the underlying sigma field, but as a family of events to be thought of as conditional events, but they're a primitive. And uh, associated with each of those, a probability measure on the particular field, and uh, some properties, of course, to make the system behave nicely. Uh, Rennie's motivation uh, was absolutely not game theoretic, which is not surprising since this whole slab of game theory did not exist at the time. Back in the early days, the era of game theory. Um, but firstly, was his But this idea, which we, I think you'll dare to go back a few slides. Let's see. Yes, I dare. Uh, allows us to formulate in uh, proper generality and with, with, with well-behaved properties a uh, probability theory that specifies as well these, if you like, conditional probabilities that will just specify as a primitive and some properties to make the system behave nicely. Uh, in the game trees. So we've solved two puzzles and seen, I hope, the centrality of probability zero in game theory. So the centrality is because probability zero is no longer, in fact, probability, if you like more broadly, but probability zero in particular is no longer simply a matter of chance. Because what is chance? It's above its control in the point of view and so in that sense it cannot be neglected. Control. That's the summary. And uh, the issue can be understood in the tree, or arises in the tree, and, 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 and needs to be addressed in the tree. It also arises in uh, a priori different looking way in the matrix, and can be addressed in the matrix. And then the two come together, and uh, I've ended with the analysis in the tree, which is where I began. Beautiful work you know, I'm referring to there um, that puts game theory at the center game theory into the action on game trees using this beautiful idea going back down to bring it. If I if I may, ten seconds remark. Please. The real Lanzewski is probably the one who did first plus one logic for me to yes. generate a lot of my effects and try to at least the time is right. So the marriage of logic and decision theory can be traced back to at least I was wondering if it was the same. The time is right. Yes. We can form it really. It was the same. It was the same. So, so. Uh, and Walsh also should be mentioned. Prop in this area is, 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 is concentrating on the conditioning eventing question. I, I just brought in the terminology. But it turns out that that was a nice reference to get. Excellent. So I have a few minutes. Uh, we've now switched, as you can see, to Alice and Bob. So that was probability zero. And uh, as I said, a slightly autobiographical talk because um, it turns out that, that probability zero really has a conceptually different place in the end theory versus the second theory. Uh, and of course, it's very nice when one identifies what are inherently multi-person, multi-player phenomena versus single-player phenomena. There are other examples, but not for today. Other examples in the game. Okay, uh, so, um, yeah. the reason for talking about the second is, well, either you want to look at the number line, or because I work on a second. So, here I'm going to, um, talk very briefly about uh, one result, which I will quote, uh, 
in uh, foundations of quantum mechanics. This is, of course, mathematical physics, not physics. Meaning, I will talk about some probability theory, which I am just about qualified to talk about. Um, I will not talk about physics, except in as much as I talk about probability theory. I believe that is called mathematical physics. And uh, that said, let me just describe the scenario in question. Um, we have our two, I don't know if we should still call them players or experimenters, Alice and Bob, and each uh, is involved in uh, conducting some kind of measurement, perhaps in between these two little uh, measurement uh, devices, a pair of particles uh, has been prepared in a particular state. But we're not going to get into the physics even to the extent I can do so. Uh, and it is sent off in opposite directions, one to Alice and one to Bob. And they, they conduct a measurement on their respective particles, and they each have a choice of two measurements. So Alice can conduct a measurement A or A prime, and similarly Bob. And uh, they do this, and they keep, they, they keep uh, tables of what they see. The outcome of any of the four measurements is, is binary. It's either 0 or 1. So if you uh, want to put a little more uh, substance on it, we might be talking about sort of spin. It might be up or down. But I'm just going to put 0 or 1. And uh, so read the rows here. Uh, as the resulting frequency distributions. Empirically observed with the magic of statistics so that I've extracted all this to uh, four probability measures. So if Anne happens to select measurement A and Bob happens to select measurement B, so the first <coughs> row there, um, what they observe is uh, a show. In other words, if we take their two tabulations, perhaps they're far apart, and compare and put them together, what we see is half the time both players observe the outcome zero, and half the time they both observe the outcome one, and zero on the other two cases. And then the second row, and has happened uh, to choose A prime, and B is Bob's choice. Any time that happens, again, we tabulate, and what we find are probabilities of reading across the row, 3 eighths, 1 eighth, 1 eighth. Okay, so uh, this, in fact, is, uh, uh, if you like, an empirical model in some kind of clear oh, term that's used in this area. Uh, this, is, this is, in fact, realizable in quantum mechanics. Um, people who know will know that this table is often used to prove Bell's theorem. There's one way to prove Bell's theorem, but all I'm saying right now is here is an empirical model, so-called. Um, nice to know it's physically realizable. OK. So let's uh, try to build a model that brings in nature, if you like. Maybe I'm just speaking more as a game theorist. I'm sure I'm speaking more as a game theorist than a uh, mathematical physicist. Uh, that brings in nature uh, in the following sense. Let's suppose. <laughs> that there's an underlying choice by nature, a uh, state of preparation of the two particles together. Uh, the term hidden variable is, of course, used in this area. I don't have time to go into the literature on hidden variables. You can view my omegas here as, in a sense, a, 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 a universal hidden variable. It actually this is probably obvious to all the distinguished brains in the audience. It actually, uh, the invariable analysis can always be cast in this form. Um, but I'm not going to go into that now. So, um, for example, omega 1 is, 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 I'll speak game theory light, although there are no payoffs here, is nature's choice. And nature's choice says, I, I nature, determined that the outcomes of possible measurements look as in the second row. So there are four possible measurements. Uh, they could be undertaken in various pairs, of course. But there are four possible like elementary measurements. And um, I make sure to determine that the outcome of any of the first three is zero, uh, and the fourth is one. And there are 16 that <coughs> or 
possibilities for nature, which I seem to have written in some binary fashion here. I'm not sure that plays a role in this talk. It plays a role in something else I was working on. Um, and let's ask the question, can we find a probability measure on omega, omega 0 through omega 15, that induces the empirical probabilities? And by induces, I mean, for example, uh, if we started with this table, what would we say would be the probability that if Ann and Bob choose little a and little b respectively, remember that was one of the, um, that's in that first row here, okay, um, that the probabilities would be like we saw, a half, zero, zero, a half. Well, what we do, obviously, the naturally induced empirical model would add up, so we're looking at a and b, the probabilities of omega zero, omega one, and if you're better at binary arithmetic than I am, there wasn't that big in my interest, um, we'll pick off the other two omegas that have zeros in the a and b columns, so right? there'll be four omegas, and so the total probability of, of those four under p would be the probability of, let's go back here, that first entry, a half. we pick off the other probabilities correspondingly. So again, if we stuck to little a and little b, um, we break the 16 probabilities into four groups of four, add up, and, and use the empirical model that way. And uh, so an interesting question to ask, which for those of you who are um, uh, aware of or knowledgeable about the whole hidden variable question in quantum mechanics can be expressed in this form, at least in the finite setting, I mean, this is one portion, based on what I've done, um, uh, is um, can we find find such a probability measure? Starting from some, let us say, physically real realizable. Yeah. Yeah. Um, for one dreadful moment, I think it's a question. <laughs> um, so um, here's a claim. Uh, which uh, is certainly not given any formal status here, but there's a theorem coming in a few minutes that has negative probabilities, so uh, very few minutes. Um, so uh, let me just uh, be clear uh, that this is a preliminary step. So here's a claim, which I'm going to make in some meta fashion for now, uh, which is, well, if this empirical model was a classically realizable situation, maybe involving urns and balls, then yes, we can. Why? We just built this. Perhaps the measurements are funded in each case to either testing the color of the ball that's plucked out by hours or given to hours, or its weight, and similarly the ball. And so the answer is, even though in this case, for any particular trial, as checks only color or weight, we could also simply build a system in which it checks both. That's some kind of meta claim for the existence of such a P. If you like, you take this definition of the classical domain. Um, this is a non-local theory in the future. Um, well, I'm so far in classical. In quantum theory, yes. you can make it invariable if you have a non-local theory. All negative probabilities. All negative. Yes. A, I'm sure you're well ahead of me. This is only up to the same measure. So in the quantum domain, we may not be able to. So this, of course, can be checked directly in this case. That's a proof of Bell's theorem. <coughs> one of the no-go theorems, the most famous no-go theorem. Um, you can also make this meta argument that you can't build such an experiment because of the incompatibility of A and A prime. Um, in fact, incompatibility in this sense <coughs> can be seen as the fundamental driver of the impossibility. Okay? Of course, the impossibility is a beautiful case of the weakness from strength. The incompatibility actually allows you to create correlations, I haven't emphasized correlations, but interesting probabilities, physically realizable, such as these, that cannot be created classically. 
So the incompatibility is actually an asset, which is the whole point of the quantum information table. Um, beautiful case, perhaps one of the rather fundamental case of from a limitation comes great possibility. Okay. Uh, here is a theorem. Um, uh, proven with Samson and Bransky, who I feel is here in spirit today, um, uh, which says that uh, what we can, uh, let me emphasize one way around, we could always build one of these extended models. Um, I said in this case, for example, starting with this empirical model, we can't. We can always build one of these in extended models if we allow ourselves to use sign probability measures. So instead of T being an ordinary non-negative probability measure on omega, it is a sign probability measure. Uh, always provided we're talking about empirical models of the so-called no single point. I don't have time to go into that now. Um, that is a superset of the set of empirical models that are realizable in quantum mechanics. So it certainly includes such, such models. Uh, in fact, we overshoot quantum mechanics, as was famously observed. Um, the so-called no signaling empirical models strictly include those realizable in quantum mechanics. But uh, the entry of signed probability measures, including therefore negative probabilities, so we would put positive probabilities or, or probability on some of the states omega and negative on others. Of course, things would work out so that all that is observable is not negative because we induce the empirical model. So we can maintain, although now I'm surely opening uh, the subject that should not be opened at the end of the talk, we can, uh, we can maintain, a, a, dare I use the word weight for this? Probably not, but I did. Uh, view of probability, because the observed probabilities are all non-negative, uh, because that's precisely what we're doing. We're inducing an empirical model. Okay, so I will end with, as I said, I, nonsense. I began with common sense, but it's still like that, so I will end with nonsense, except maybe common sense. So this is, uh, as I said, uh, mildly autobiographical, um, or my, my trip down the number line. And uh, so the emergence of negative probabilities in quantum mechanics is not a new idea. Um, the result I alluded to, which has proved uh, much more general structures than I'm indicating, um, brings out uh, um, exactly what negative probabilities give us, um, namely this large world that I just alluded to of not just the quantum, but the super quantum, the so-called no signaling world. Um, and uh, um, negative probabilities are, according to uh, some of the giants, very reasonable, just as reasonable as I believe Feynman said. I'm not sure it's over here, I should have the Feynman quote, but I, I was hung up on the common sense and nonsense uh, as a negative number of apples. Just start the day with some number, give up some, and gain some. Um, <laughs> all numbers. Um, so, from positive to zero to negative probability. Um, thank you.
that the model in physics with negative probabilities has the same status. Uh, I think GRW is now quite a well-developed theory, and bomb theory is also theory, but it seems that now GRW is the best theory for this kind of thing. So what if, since I work in model mechanics of a practical sort, uh, the, the way in which this thing arises, you know, with the negative probabilities, is through the so-called uh, linear transforms. And if, if, if wherever the, the, the so-called linear, the word probability should, honestly should not be used. That's right. Uh, right. So what, in, the, in the regions in which the uh, linear transform acts like a probability, you're in a situation where you're completely measurable. And what the, the physicists actually do is to ignore the other regions. They literally ignore them. So they go from something that's physically <laughs> measurable, physically measurable, physically measurable. The, uh, I think that it's just turned out to be a mistake to use the word probability for this. It's a more complicated phenomenon. That's comment one. Comment two is that everybody should recognize that it, uh, things like the ability to try to measure gravity waves, which are really small effects. It's based on the other side of this, which is, if, uh, it may be the position and momentum can't be done simultaneously, but you can do either as close as you like with a sufficient, uh, uh, sufficiently accurate measuring instrument. I'm just wondering whether the latter thing that I just mentioned has some significance here. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, the fact that, that uh, if, if you're only interested in getting partial information, uh, as in the case of quantum, uh, whether you can get uh, measure gravity waves, you actually get information out of it, even though the paradox, you know, the simultaneous measurability doesn't enter into it. It's the positive part. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You, know, you get, should get a huge amount of information out of the market. So, I mean, just, I'm really accurate to say anything as well. Sure. So, uh, uh, right, so the, 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 the negative region, so to speak, in the, under the sign of measure, and I, I would have called it a sign probability measure, is a uh, language that can be challenged. Yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not a sign measure in the sense of people taking the courses because we're talking about the operators in open spaces. Mm -hmm. Right. It's, a, it's actually a, a, a different subspace. So, I, I mean, we're very careful to say that what I have here for the finite state case. And in that, in, in this case, um, right, all you get to see are the positive regions, right? The right. Uh, that, um, that is the, parallel. I mean, yes, yeah, so it has parallel. That's the, the, the way that it's going to be the case. Yeah. And your last point. Um, it's very interesting. Okay. Okay. So let's